So we are looking at the sixth chapter of the book of Galatians. This is the last chapter of this book. I thought I would get all the way through it tonight, but I only got my study in through verse 10. So if we go further than that, I'll have to wing it. <laughs> no, I'm joking. The Lord always helps to do whatever is needed. But in the previous chapter, you know, it's been a little while since I taught this, but the Bible is teaching us about the fruit of the Spirit. In the fifth chapter of the book of Galatians, we see the fruit of the Spirit. And I told you that when the tree is planted correctly, when it's, when it's uh, put in the right kind of soil, when it's uh, standing in the right place, it always will bear fruit. It's inevitable. If you've got a healthy tree that's got the right soil and the right provision, then it will always bear fruit fruit. Remember that. And so it is with the fruit of the Spirit. If we are walking in relationship with Jesus Christ, if our, we are grounded in his word and the power of the Holy Spirit is functioning in us because we place our faith in Christ, who he is and what he has done, and then the Holy Spirit is working in us, you cannot stop the fruit of the Spirit from starting to come out of your life. You can't stop it. It's inevitable. Any more than a healthy fruit tree could decide it's not going to bear fruit, a child of God is properly planted and properly in what is their provision in Christ cannot stop these things from starting to develop in their life. And the first one of these is love. You cannot understand, you cannot be where you need to be in Christ and not love people. That's an impossibility. So if we're not truly loving people, it's not, there's something wrong. You know, remember that Jesus in the, in the story of the Bible said he looked at the fig tree and he talked about how he dug around. There are parables about the tree, how they dug around him and gave him an opportunity to, to start. All they did was to reestablish the foundation. They didn't put in, graft in some more big branches. They just tended to the necessities to make that fruit healthy. And then they came back and expected fruit out of it. So when we're, as, as children of God, when we're planted firmly in Christ, who he is and what he has done, then the Holy Spirit is given the license to work in us. Only God can love people through me. I don't know about y'all, there may be some of you here that you're just born loving people. But I've always said you could go, it'd be real easy to go to heaven if you didn't have to live around people. <laughs> because people are what is our problem so often in life. Amen. Amen, Sister Allen. You know, it's the people that we have to deal with that cause us to want to get angry and aggravated and upset and mad and all those other things that it's the people. And so loving people is a supernatural work. Oh, it's easy to love those who love you and, you know, who spoil you and who give you everything you want and say yes ma'am to you all the time. It's easy to love those kind of people, or yes sir. It's easy, but it's not so easy to love those that rub you the wrong way, but you know, it takes rubbing the wrong way to fix us sometimes. That's why we need to love even those who are unlovable as far as we're concerned. Because then it rubs us correctly and molds us correctly, moves us from off of our satisfied place. So love will automatically grow in us. And then, of course, there's love, joy, uh, there's peace and gentleness and long-suffering. All these things will start budding out in your life. And you won't see them immediately because the fruit, fruit takes a little while to mature. But when you look back over the last few months or years, you're amazed all of a sudden that the things that you did not have in your life back then, you didn't love, you didn't have any peace, all of a sudden you go, wow, how did that happen? And it's an amazing thing, the work of God that is done in us when we keep our faith, keep ourselves planted where we're supposed to be. So he's continuing here, talking about walking in the spirit at the end of chapter five. He's continuing here concerning our relationship with other people. I want you to know you cannot go to heaven and avoid other people. I don't even want to be around people. I don't like people. I'm just going to shut myself away from people. That's not an option as a child of God. 
It's not allowed. God won't allow you to walk there. Now, some of us, that's our nature. Just kind of not want to be around people. But you know what? Just because you have a nature like that don't mean it's right. Just be honest. Don't justify yourself by saying, well, that's just my nature. Because you see, God wants to change our nature. We're not supposed to live through life with the same old nature that we had when we were little children growing up. God wants to change our nature. I'm by, by nature a loner. But that's not right. It's not right to be a loner. You need to be involved with people because that's part of being a child of God. So we have to let God change us so that we learn that we're part of a body. And we all need each other. That's what the scripture says. We all need each other. What do you compare it to? You compare it to your physical body. Your, your body needs your hand, needs your eyes to function correctly. And we're all like that in the body of Christ. We have our place. And when we're not there, when we're not actively involved in the body of Christ, there's something missing. There's a hole that we're not filling that needs to be filled. So he's saying here, leading us on concerning how we should treat other people. The first thing he says in verse number one of chapter six is, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, this doesn't just mean man in the sense of male. It's talking about if a person, a, bro a, a brother or a sister in the body of Christ, this is talking about Christians, it's not talking about people that are out in the world. It's talking about Christians. It says, if a brother be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. You know, this scripture right here is really getting down to the cutting edge of living in the Christian body. You know, we look around at each other and we should always consider this group of people that we go to church with and the people that we're connected with in the body. We know they're born again believers. We know that they're in agreement in our spirit. Those people are very important and special and they should become very important and special to us. God help us to remember that. I don't know about you, but it gets real easy just to kind of take people for granted, doesn't it? But each person in the body of Christ is important and special. They are special to God and should be special to us. Not just a pastor, not just somebody in leadership, but the, you know, the one, you know, I, I think about it sometimes. How many people do you go to church with all the time and don't even know their name? Think about it. I'm not asking you to tell me. But the fact that you made no effort to get to know their name might mean that you don't care anything about them, really much about them anyway. Come on, now I know it takes a little while to get to know everybody's name, but are you growing in that? People who don't talk very much, do you step out of your way? You know, there are people, you, they're going to be in your face all the time. <laughs> they're going to be there all the time for you to talk to, and they're real easy to get to know. But there's some people in the shadows that you may not ever know if you don't make a step in that direction to get to know them. And that's important in the body of Christ. No one should feel like nobody cares about them in the body of Christ. No one should. God help us and remind us. I have to be reminded. I'm one of those kind of people who just walk through and oh well, you know. But that shouldn't be. That's one of my faults. So I'm, I'm in a fault, so now y'all got to restore me. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? We, we all have some faults. We all have something wrong with us. Come on. There's not a per perfect one in the room. I don't have to know you to say that. I just know that's true. The only one who is perfect, you know, they crucified. There's nobody here that's perfect. So he says here, if you know that a brother, this is talking about a child of God, a man, a child of God, has been, has been the Bible says here, overtaken in a fault. That implies that this man wasn't trying to sin. He fell into a situation. Anybody ever done that? You know, something comes along. Come on. Something comes along. 
could be something as simple as telling a lie because you don't want to make people feel bad. You fell into a sin. You fell into a fault. There, there, whatever. There are times when somebody might get caught in a situation, a relationship, or, or an act. You know, someone who was an alcoholic and they might accidentally, you know, get in a position where they take a drink and maybe it might cause them to fall into a fault. We're not supposed to just go, well, yo, dog. That's who you are. You know, we should never have those kind of attitudes. The Bible says when someone is overtaken, I don't care what kind of fault it is. Everybody needs to go to heaven and we need to try our best to see them go there. And when someone falls, it should be the cry of our heart for restoration. That should be our cry to restore somebody who falls. Never to kick them down any further than they've already gone. But to reach out a hand of compassion. And it goes on to say, ye which are spiritual. Sometimes people that claim to be so spiritual are so high up on a pedestal they can't see anybody else. And so they don't even know who's falling. you got to be down among the people, like Jesus was, by the way. Jesus never was on a pedestal. He walked around the cities of the street, uh, the streets of the cities. And, and you know, they criticized him because he his, his garments touched those dirty people. That's what Jesus did. He walked among the dirty. He walked among the sick. He walked among the sinners. And he got criticized for it. But God help us to ever feel like we're higher than other people. There's not anybody that you would have to stoop down to restore because we just got to reach out because all of us are in that position where we can fall. So we should never, never feel that way. He says that we, we which are spiritual, if you feel like you've been saved a while and, and maybe you think, well, I'm, I'm not ever going to turn my back on Jesus or do anything that would bring any shame to him. And that's the cry of our heart, isn't it? If you're a child of God, man, I don't ever bring any shame to Jesus. But you know what? Someday I might. But you might be one of those kind of people that, that you might feel like, well, you know, God's really delivered me from so many things and I've grown so much. Well, then that is the option that you must reach forward to to try to encourage those. Now, there's, there's people that are going to turn away from God. You, you can do everything you can to bring them back. So you have to understand, but you still don't give up until you know God says, just let it go. you got to keep on reaching out for people who need to be restored. Then it says, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Now, meekness is not weakness. Meekness is a tenderness that has strength with it. Meekness is a person who is very strong, but doesn't exalt that strength or that power, but they become meek and, and humble in a situation so that they can help somebody else. So, in the spirit of meekness, the scripture says, considering thyself. You know, every now and then we need to have a checkup on ourselves. Sometimes you just need to look in the mirror and say, who are you and what are you doing? Come on. We need to understand that all of us are fallible. We used to say we're all made out of dirt right up to our armpits. We are, we were created out of the earth, created out of dirt from the beginning. So we're all capable of falling. There's not a one of us in here. And I would dare say that we could all say there was a time when I've fallen, when I've sinned, when I fell into a situation that I regretted. And oh, how good it would have been sometimes for somebody to have come along and loved me through it. Come on. How important it is to love people through it. Not ever to condemn. You know, they've got enough people that have fallen into sin have enough condemnation. They don't need anybody in the church to, to condemn them. We're in the soul saving business, not the soul crushing business. It's so important. This is so crucial. If anybody sins or falls into a sin, oh, God, help us to reach out our arms of love and compassion and say, I love you. I'm praying for you. Don't give up. Don't quit. Encouraging people like that. Don't quit. 
And it says, considering myself, lest thou also be tempted. So often, you know, I've seen people that were so, so strict to condemn somebody in a sin that the next thing you know, they're in that same sin. And sometimes I think it's just a because of the pride and they get lifted up and they think they're so good and then something comes along and snares them. The original word for restore is a word that I'm not going to try to pronounce. It's a Greek word. And it signifies to set in joint as a dis dislocated bone. Well, I tell you, I've never had one, a dislocated bone. But I'm sure I've seen a lot of old Westerns where they had to stick that bone back in place. <laughs> you better get something to put between your teeth. <laughs> Some reason I pull that bone. <laughs> Y'all ever seen that? <laughs> Y'all know it's me. <laughs> but that dislocated bone, have you ever felt like a dislocated bone? out of joint. Accordingly, we should endeavor to set them in joint again. To bring them to themselves by convincing them that even though they have fallen, we don't condone the sin. When a person falls into sin, you don't condone the sin. You just got to convince them that you love them in spite of their sin. That's where you got to go. People have to know that they are loved, that you care enough to stop, to care enough about them, that you want to get this joint back in place again where it's supposed to be. And it says pers persuading them to return to their duty. Boy, I thought, hmm, I don't know about that. Some of us think if you fall, you better not ever try to do nothing anymore. Because look at you, you fail. God forbid. God, if God only used perfect people that never fail, he wouldn't have anybody to use. Because we've all fallen at some time to thank God that somebody decided to love you past your fall. You know, I know people that have fallen to, uh, dark into sin, but I'm going to tell you what, when they come back to get back in their place in the body of Christ, they should be welcomed with open arms, loved and cared for, restored to that position. Not made a little bit lower than other people. Well, you're back, but we're going to remember you. No, not in a million years. You just bring them back and love them. Bring them back into the body of Christ. They're just as good as anybody in the building. Because they're restored and they're forgiven. How great that is. And then it says, comforting them in a sense of pardoning mercy thereupon. And having thus recovered them, confirming our love to them. And that's what it's all about. The scripture tells us to love people. The next verse says, Bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Do you know what the law of Christ is? Does anybody know? You know, there we've been dealing with the, the law of Moses in the book of Galatians. So when the law of Moses was fulfilled and Jesus Christ came and died on the cross, the law that replaced the law of Moses was the law of love. Jesus said, hang all the law on these two things. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your late neighbor as yourself. The law of Christ is love. Because you see, if we love correctly, all those other things will fall into place. All of those things. If we love God with all of our heart, we don't want to offend God or hurt God. We want, we, want him to, we want him to be pleased with us. And if we love people, we want to hurt them. We want to restore and encourage people if we love them. You know, I don't care what my kids do. I'm not going to kick them out. I'm not going to say don't ever come back to the door of this house. Of course, my kids aren't in that shape. But y'all understand what I'm talking about. Don't ever come back to see me. No, that should not be the way we treat our children who fall. Doesn't mean you're going to fix everything for them all the time, and they might have to spend some time in jail or whatever, but they should always know we love them. And so it is in the body of Christ that we must have that law of love. He bears with us under our weaknesses and our craziness. Jesus bears with us. Did you know that? You know, if we compared ourselves to him, we'd all be pretty fallen, 
crazy people. When we, we compared ourselves to the perfection of Christ, I'm going to tell you what, the fact that we're in his family and he loves us the way he does should teach us a lesson. There's nobody beneath the love of Christ, and we should never put somebody beneath our love. And if we're having trouble loving somebody, we need to repent, ask God to forgive us, and ask him to do that supernatural work of loving us for the people that he already loves enough that he died for every single one of them. Then it says, he is touched with a fellow feeling of our infirmities. Don't you like that scripture? He's touched with the feeling of your infirmities. So when you fall and you're weak in some area, guess what? The Lord cares about you. He doesn't say, you sorry thing, I'm giving up on you. No, he doesn't. He's touched. He cares. When he sees you slip in some area, he, you know, he's not ready to throw you away or toss you out. He's ready to reach out to you and love you, and he is touched with that. He cares about that. He is standing carefully watching. Verse number three says, For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. Well, let me tell you who we all are in this house tonight. You, I may not, I'm not going to win any elections with this. <laughs> all of us are nothing. I'm going to tell you the only thing good about us is the good man that lives in us. It's the only thing good about me. The only thing that enables me to help anybody is him living in me. So, we should never think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. Because if there's any glory that is accomplished in my life, it's not me. If there's any goodness accomplished in my life, it's not me. It's the wonderful work of Jesus. You know, I've always told you this, but I'm going to remind you again. Some people think when you get to heaven, you're going to get rewarded with crowns. And you think there's going to be people walking around heaven with crowns piled up to the sky because they are so greatly approved of God because they've done so many wonderful things. I want to remind you that every crown that is awarded in heaven is going to be thrown at the feet of Jesus Christ. Because there's not a thing you've ever done worth being rewarded for that it wasn't Jesus doing it in you and through you. So we should never think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. As long as we stay submitted, yielded to the Lord, understanding how great he is, how great he is, how small I am, then he can always work through us effectively. So it says, and a verse, uh, I found this couple of verses, Philippians 2 and 3. Philippians 2 and 3 says, Let nothing be done through vain or vain, through strife or vain glory. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Wow. Does that put you at the bottom of the pile? Is that where it puts us? Let everyone esteem others better than themselves. You know, I'll tell you whether or not that's working in me when I see that there's chocolate pie in the dessert counter. And I make sure I'm first in line. <laughs> I'm not esteeming others better than myself. I'm being sure I get some chocolate pie. Come on. But if we're not careful, we're, about, we're like that about a lot of things. We really are ready to push ahead, ignore people. Get first. Be ahead. Come on. The scripture says, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Don't, don't do something so people will brag on you. Goodness, not because they brag on you. You know, I, I, sometimes when people say to me, Sister Ellen, that was really a good message. Or, you know, I always leave the church. And on my way home, I sit behind the steering wheel of my car. And I say, God. You didn't get who used to be. Oh, God. I didn't deserve it. 
I have never deserved to be used of God, but God has always graciously and wonderfully done what he does so magnificently, and that is to share in the hearts of people the divine and precious word of God. I have nothing to give anyone. It must be the work of the Holy Spirit. So any time that we're trying to do something, we want we get proud when people brag on us. I'm telling you what, people don't understand, but I always say to God be the glory because I'm going to tell you, I don't care what it is. If I'm able to do anything at all that blesses anybody at all, it's to God be the glory because he's the one, he's the only one who can do anything worth doing. He's surely the only one who can change a heart. I can't, but he can and so many times I've just been amazed. Have you ever been amazed that God used you? Have you ever done that? Have you ever went away from a situation and went, oh, wow. Isn't that the most amazing thing in the world? It keeps you in proper perspective and makes you stay where you belong. <laughs> Amen. First Corinthians 13 and 4 says, Charity, that's love, suffers long. And is kind. Oh, God, help me. Kind. Boy, that's a hard word, isn't it? Charity suffers long and is kind. And, and is charity envieth not. Love vaunteth not itself and is not puffed up. In the body of Christ, how we need this. Verse number four. But let every man prove his own work. Then, she, then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. You know, when you can know that you've been used of God, you've laid everything down and you've walked where God wants you to go, at the end of the day, you can rejoice. You don't, you don't, you know, somebody else doesn't have to brag on you. You can just know with confidence that God used you. And that's the greatest feeling in the world. Every man shall bear his own burden. Let him that is taught of the word communicate him that teaches in all good things. Now he's going into your relationship with the minister or pastoral people who are helping you spiritually. He's saying, let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. So it is your responsibility, and I know I'm standing up here. And so you think, well, Sister Ann, he's trying to get somebody to brag on you. That's not true at all. But it is the responsibility of the body of Christ to honor and to, to communicate good things unto the people who are teaching you good things. So when you're growing and God is using someone else in your life, it is such a good thing to communicate those things to the people that God has placed in that position. Not because of bragging, but just to encourage the one that God has placed in that position. That's a very dangerous and serious position to be in. People who stand in this pulpit are going to answer to God for the people they minister to. And it's a very important thing not just to brag on somebody and make them feel good. That is not the reason. But sometimes, you know, we just, people need to know that what God gave them was really what was needed for the hour. And so he's saying here, let him that is taught in the word. Sometimes that's me. Sometimes it's you. Let those who are taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. And you know, this scripture in 2 Corinthians 1 and 24, I never really looked at it before clearly. But look what it says. It says, not for that we have dominion over your faith, but are helpers of your joy that by faith you may stand. So our job as teachers and ministers in the body of Christ is not to dominate you or to control you. That's not, that's not at all where a leader or a teacher should be. But the scripture says here, we are the helpers of your joy. Don't you like that? i never seen that like that before. That just stood out to me in something I had never really noticed. We are the helpers of your joy. So when you get taught the word by someone who's teaching the values of the scripture, it should increase your joy because the closer we get to God and the more we know of him, the joy will increase. The spirit of the Lord rising in us, the confidence brings that joy to our lives. So ministers of the gospel are, for, are here for the purpose. The scripture says we are helpers of your joy. For listen to this, for by faith you stand. 
So if I can increase your faith, if someone ministering and preaching can increase your faith, it's not to say we are dominating you. It's that you're standing forward to say, hey, man, I've got that. That's awesome. We're not brainwashing people. That's not where we go. We're here to encourage you so that you can have the personal joy that only your faith can bring in your own life. Every child of God should be walking in that joyful faith. Verse number seven. Be not deceived. Boy, this is the script. That, those three words right there are so powerful. They're the thing Jesus warned first about when it came to the last days. Be not deceived. I used to think that be not deceived meant to not be deceived by preachers who are preaching false doctrine. Now I know that to be not deceived means you better watch everything you hear and everything you see. Because deception is not just coming from the pulpit anymore. It's coming from everywhere under the sun. It's bombarding your environment right now. The Bible gives you the responsibility. Put that finger right here. God gives you the responsibility to not be deceived. How do you keep from being deceived? You get in the word. And anything that contradicts the word is deception. You know, I don't care. I'm just going to touch one thing right here. I don't care how many people claim that abortion is not wrong. I don't care how many people say that abortion is not murder, and there's thousands and thousands and thousands of people right out there hollering that abortion is a woman's choice, it's not murder. I don't care who it is. From the top to the bottom of all people in this whole world crying out that abortion is not wrong and it is not murder, the Bible declares clearly that it is. So many times in the scripture, God spoke of knowing somebody in their mother's womb. Excuse me, God knowing somebody in their mother's womb means they are a person in the womb. Now, if you've had an abortion, God forgives, so I'm not bringing any condemnation. But don't justify it by saying it's okay. And the lie that people are born being homosexuals is a lie. It's a sin, it's not a disease. Come on. So therefore, the scripture is clear. So even though it becomes popular to say it's okay to be gay, it's okay to have an abortion, just because it's popular and you're hearing it all over the world, doesn't mean you're supposed to go along with it. We are responsible to know the word of God ourselves so we personally are not deceived. If your wife or husband's deceived, if your children are deceived, if your pastor's deceived, if your friends are deceived, you got a personal responsibility yourself, by yourself, not to be deceived. Those are just two illustrations. There are many illustrations I'll give you of deception that's being taught in the world today. You gotta make up your mind. You're not gonna be moved by that, by what other people are saying. You might have friends that encourage you, oh, you should believe this, that, or the other. You better get it straight. You better get in the Word of God because you're not going to stand before God and answer for what your preacher said or what your friend said or what your parents said or what your kids said. You're going to stand before God and answer for that book that maybe you're holding in your lap tonight or it's on your phone. That book is what you're going to answer for before God. You may not live it perfectly, but you're flat and more better believe it perfectly. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Other people can be mocked because they say stuff they don't mean. You better stop that. I'm going to wear you out. And that kid goes in his other room and goes, hee, 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 mom ain't going to do that. <laughs> you mocked because you lied. Come on. Come on. Did that hurt a little bit? Oh. <laughs> Come on. Don't lie to you, kid. You'll be a monkey. You gonna do it? Say it. If you ain't, shut up. That right? They'll mock you. Isn't that right? You know. That's a good point, man. I need to labor that a little bit. <laughs> I remember a time when I told Kathy something.
something, and she went up the hill from my house, and she didn't know I was washing dishes looking out the window. She got about halfway up the hill, turned around and stuck her tongue out at me. I went out my front door, and I said, Catherine, now, now, and you get back down here. She did, too, and I wore her behind down. She didn't stick her tongue out again. <laughs> You can't believe that about Kathy. I know you don't can't believe that. <laughs> what I want you to know is people who lie, you can't ever trust the people talk about them walk them behind their back. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. No. Nope. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. I feel impelled to say to you today, compelled to say to you today, that if you're forgiven, your sins are under the blood, you won't reap. Oh, there's some things you reap, even though their sins are under the blood. If you, you know, if you go deep in debt and you get saved, you may still be deep in debt. <laughs> but thank God, God can help you get out of debt. You know, just keep on paying your tithe, keep on doing what God said, and he can help you get out of debt. But the debt's not gonna go away just because you got forgiven. And if you go around you know, committing adultery, you may, not, you may lose your wife and not get her back. It's because you sins covered under the blood, you're forgiven. You may not get your wife back. So there's some things that you're going to reap if you, if you sow some seed. But thank God, as far as God's concerned, it's all under the blood that's forgiven. Praise the Lord, and God will always take you back. Then it says, For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. So I'm just going to tell you that you're going to bear fruit out of what you plant seeds in. Say that again. That's a good point. You're going to get fruit out of where you place seed. So if you throw seed in a, you know, somewhere in the wind and it goes out in the ocean, you're not going to reap much of anything. Or if you sow it, uh, you know, you... He grows up among the thistles and thorns, you may have been hit to it. But if you don't sow it correctly, in the right thing, the right places, and I'm not just talking about money, I'm talking about everything you do and everything you say and the life you live. You plant those good seeds, then it says you'll reap. Then it says, For he that sows to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that sows to the spirit shall of the spirit leave, reap life everlasting. Let us not be weary in well doing. For in due season we shall reap what we faint not. Now I'm going to ask you a question. What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing in the kingdom of God? The Bible says don't be weary in well doing. That means everybody should be doing something in the kingdom of God in the body of Christ. There's a purpose for everybody to be busy doing something to help out the kingdom of God. So you ask yourself the question, what am I doing? How am I a blessing to the kingdom of God? Then don't get weary in that. When things don't go the way you think they ought, or you get tired, but in due season you will reap. If you don't faint, you don't quit. Don't let somebody offend you. And then it goes on to say in verse number 10, As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, to all men, but listen to this last little part, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. In other words, we are truly supposed to be more concerned about people who are part of the body of Christ. They're the people we should hurt, we should help first. Now, thank God, he'll give us the opportunity to reach out and touch people that are lost, that are not a part of the body of Christ. But when it comes to doing good and helping, we should be first and quick to do our best to help somebody who is a part of the body of Christ. That's what the scripture's saying here. So God helps us to understand the crucial and wonderful joy of being a part of this body. Should never take it for granted. Never take it for granted. When we come to the house of the Lord, we should come ready to greet people. You know, there are people that come to church to scoot in on the very first chair they sit and scoot out when the first day met. They're missing such a great joy of learning to know the wonderful people who make up the kingdom of God. So if you see some people like that, catch them. <laughs> get over there. Position yourself. And when you see them, get up. Be sure you go and greet them and tell them how glad you are that they're here. You know, sometimes it's really hard to come into a church. 
It really is. When you fail, the enemy meets you in the driveway. What do you do to come in here? He'll even tell you, everybody knows what you did. Who do you think you are? So it's hard, it's hard sometimes for some people to come through the door. They fight a huge battle to get here. Never let them feel like that wasn't fighting. Always let them know that Oasis of Love truly is that place where people are treasured above anything else in the world. Because that's all that's going to heaven with you is people jump to stay in here. All right. Let's love. God help us to love. I want us to go, Lord, in prayer. We're sitting in a, another precarious position. Tonight, you can, you can turn this off, Craig. Uh, we have a storm coming again. And um, we certainly want to pray concerning that. We're also on the doors of an election in this country. And we definitely need God to intervene. So uh, we want to pray for both of these things. I hope you will be inter interceding and praying. Uh, make it a point to know what you're voting for. Yes. Okay. Which is what? Abortion. It's saying that Louisiana has about nine or ten uh, new amendments, and and one of them is about abortion. So get yourself educated. Okay, Nagish Times had them all explained. So, but you can find all this on the internet. Go on the internet. I went today and I found uh, the platform of both parties. I typed in search, what is the platform of both political parties? And I got a perfect printout. In fact, I printed out a sheet that told what the parties are standing for. And so I want to read through both of those things and see which one is closest to the bottom. So you're not really voting for a man. You're voting for what the whole party stands for. Not only that, in this case, you know, we got two guys that are running for president that are not young anymore. So you might want to vote for the vice president that you'd like to have as your president. They're debating tonight, so you might want to listen to what they have to say, but also you might want to check out their past. What has Mike Pence done? What does he stand for? What has Kamala Harris done? What does she stand for? Check those out, because you might want to be voting the vice president in right? Come on. So God help us to, to search. Find out. Don't be ignorant. Don't be ignorant about the election. Pray about it and, and find out what is going on before you go in there. Go in there. Okay. Donna and Judy have some people in slide in. So let's go to the Lord in prayer right now. We're going to pray about that storm and then we're going to pray about this election. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight in the wonderful name of Jesus. Lord, we stand here tonight as a body of believers, united together. Lord, we do love each other. And, oh, God, help our love to increase and to reach out further. God, that we reach out beyond where we, our little circle of people that we know well and, and get to know people that we don't know and encourage them all, Father, we pray. That no one be excluded around here in any way in this body. Now, Lord, I pray tonight that you'll put your hand upon upon this storm that's coming into Louisiana, oh God. They have told us that it is absolutely coming into Louisiana. But Lord, and I'm not asking it to go to some other state. I'm asking you, oh God, to reduce the ferocity of that thing. Father, we come against it in the name of Jesus, and we ask you to stop those winds from, from roaring the way they're roaring, Father, and just move and undertake in a mighty way. Lord, those people in the southern part of the state, so many of them have been devastated already, and we cry out in the name of Jesus for them. And we pray, oh God, that in your wonderful holy name, you will intervene greatly for the state of Louisiana, God. We, we plead your shed blood over this state, Father, in a mighty way, and we believe you to intervene in a wonderful way and bring your hand upon the situation. And Father, we do pray for the elections that are coming up, the state elections that we have to deal with, and we should know what to vote on them. 
and God, as well as the national election. Father, help us to be educated in that which is right. Help us to compare these things with what is truth in the Word of God and vote those ways that are pleasing to you. And when we go into that booth and come out, we can know that we have done your will in, in pushing the right buttons or levers. Father, to do that which is right in your sight, we pray, oh God. And Lord, we're asking you tonight to keep us safe, keep our property safe. Lord, even, even these electricity lines and the poles that the men have worked so hard to put up, Lord, we pray you to keep them safe, Father, and everybody involved and everything involved. We, we put our trust in you, O oh God, and we ask you, in Jesus' name, let your hand rest upon us. We know you are a faithful God and you hear us when we pray. And we commit this prayer to you in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Thank you, God. Bless you so much.